Good afternoon. Welcome to Studio Korea. Welcome to the Korea Society and welcome to the Samsung Center. We are delighted to have you here today in our intimate studio audience. And for those who are listening on audio podcast or be viewing via YouTube, welcome. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Patrick Cronin today, our special featured guest. And Dr. Cronin comes with a wealth of experience. Uh, he is the senior director uh, for Asia and a senior advisor at the Center for a New American Security, uh, which plays a vital role in Washington, D.C. Uh, some of you may know Dr. Cronin from his good efforts at the National Defense University, as well as with the Institute uh, for International Strategic Studies in London, uh, and he served with the United States Agency for International Development prior to that. He has a long and very rich history, uh, going back to his education at St. Anthony's at Oxford, and we are absolutely delighted, Patrick, to have you back here at the Korea Society. Thank you for coming up today. Steve, a great pleasure always to be here with you and at the Korea Society. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for coming out uh, on this busy day. And for all those listening online or who will watch this uh, program, I hope uh, we can at least continue an important discussion uh, about U.S.-Korea relations, about U.S. role in Asia, about politics and the election and its impact. I should add the caveat that I'm speaking in my personal capacity when I talk about politics, um, only because I don't want to jeopardize the reputation and the legal standing of our nonprofit, nonpartisan center, uh, which is headed up by some great uh, leaders, Michelle Flournoy, Mm -hmm. uh, is our current chief uh, executive officer. Um, she's just flying off to Asia today, in fact, and I'll meet up with her in Asia uh, next week. Uh, Kurt Campbell is our uh, chairman of the board. Um, and together, we're just uh, launching a new New York program uh, that I may want to advertise if I could. Please do. Because beginning in December, we're going to be running a regular series of meetings between now and our presidential election in 2016 that we hope by then we'll have covered at least 10, if not more, major challenges facing the next U.S. administration, no matter what the outcome of that election is. So the first one uh, in December, uh, December 9th, uh, which we're going to be conducting at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, um, will focus on the problem that we can reduce maybe to ISIS and the Syria-Iraq issue, but it's larger questions really about the role uh, of the United States posture in terms of seeking peace and security and stability in such a troubled, difficult uh, part of the part of the world. Yeah, uh, thank you, Patrick. And that, that sounds like a you know very interesting and, and useful series over a good length of time. And our idea here today was to have Dr. Cronin share with us uh, thoughts on Asia, uh, the midterm elections, how that may or may not uh, constrain or provide opportunities in terms of U.S. Asia policy, and really the road ahead to 2016 as uh, potential candidates begin to think about Asia uh, in their portfolios. Before we get to that, though, uh, we wanted to talk first off about the headline of the day, uh, which is that of operational control in wartime, uh, because we know that is probably on the minds of some of our media here in the audience today and get your response to the meeting between the defense chiefs in Washington, D.C. And we had uh, Minister Hahn and uh, Defense Secretary Hagel yesterday agreeing to a pushback, uh, perhaps to the mid-2020s, uh, of wartime operational control. What are your thoughts, Patrick? Sure. Well, the first thought is that in any alliance where you have to be ready to take perhaps sudden military action, you don't want there to be big seams in the decision-making process. And so uh, one of the uh, values of the current Combined Forces Command in which the U.S. forces sort of take the lead and have taken the lead historically for potential wa wartime uh, engagement, although not necessarily leadership for all South Korean forces that could engage in military action, um, has meant that there would be no time lost in uh, decision-making. Um, and yet, as South Korea takes on a larger responsibility and role for security on the peninsula over time, uh, it's very important for South Korea to be in the lead. So the question is, how do you square the circle of not opening up and introducing the potential for miscalculation, misunderstanding, uh, weakening the alliance, if you will, and deterrence, deterring the kind of conflict that could come up very suddenly and unexpectedly, to making sure that South Korea actually uh, has the full sovereignty uh, as it should, uh, over such a critical set of issues. And many people would like to redefine the topic altogether, that it's not a matter of simply 
handing back wartime opcon, as they would say, to South Korea, but rather how do you evolve the current military uh, command and control structure and system that we have between the United States Armed Forces uh, and the Korean, uh, and creating a more effective uh, combined uh, decision-making apparatus with South Korea's in the lead, but really there'd be no daylight between the ability to operate together if that's what would be required. Uh, and what they've done with this latest decision on the delay of wartime OPCON uh, sort of transfer, though, uh, is what was expected. It's what's been negotiated with President Park and her government since she indicated that she did want to uh, put off the December 2015 transfer because it was just premature to uh, move ahead at this point, given growing North Korean missile and nuclear capabilities, given the, the lack of traction on inter-Korean relations uh, up to this point. And so um, there was a tacit agreement inside U.S. ROK negotiations over the last year or two that this would indeed have to be delayed. And the question was how to characterize the delay and whether the delay would be another date, which is what some maybe in South Korea uh, might want politically. They might want a date certain so that this thing does not just drag on forever in perpetuity. Uh, or uh, do you want it to be conditions-based, i.e., future decision-makers, policy-makers, uh, presidents in this case, will make the decision based on their assessment of the threat and the acceptability of creating a different command structure uh, with respect to weakening deterrence or uh, having South Korea fully ready to be um, declared as clearly in charge. In reality, South Korea is in charge. The U.S. would not be operating out of South Korea uh, without the full support and understanding and acceptance of South Korean government. So the reality is the structure already works very well together, and a lot of this is optics. <laughs> but it's more than optics. It's still a sovereignty issue. It gets down to any core neurologic issue. It's on a local issue, you'd, you'd, you'd probably say it's like textbooks in your local school. You know, who has control? Is it the state and the government, or is it you know, the local school? Who teaches your children? Well, in an alliance, I mean, who, who has uh, control over the use of force is a, is a cardinal issue. And obviously, the South Korean government has to be given the full respect of sovereignty in this issue. But in an alliance where you're trying to maximize and leverage your, your dual capabilities, you want to make sure you can leverage uh, your, your two defense forces to achieve your first purpose, which is prevent conflict from breaking out in the first place. Um, and secondly, if it does break out, uh, figuring out how to as the current objective is, restore the armistice. And if that doesn't work out, uh, how do you deal with the contingencies that evolve or devolve from there? And that takes tight command and control under very challenging, changing circumstances in a crisis. And that's not something you want to be unprepared for. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, to, to visit the timeline a little bit uh, and to get to this issue of some of the criticisms that you allude to, uh, in 2006, the issue was was first really brought up, uh, but in the uh, interim time, we have had you know, nuclear test in 2009, we've had the Chonan sinking in 2010, uh, the shelling of Yongpyong Island, and uh, that has, has given pause, it seems, to the Seoul administration on that. Um, and then you, you mentioned what was also mentioned uh, by the defense chiefs, which was namely this perception of growing North Korean capabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, do you do you sense that this is something that uh, Korean government uh, will be able to convince Korean public is the right thing, or do you think Korean opposition will try to hang their hat on some of these issues? Uh, again, I know speaking very much privately as an yes. individual observer. Well, I think Korean politics are very divisive um, on issues like this, and uh, both sides have to be respected, and there are more than two sides, but, but even both general sides uh, have to be respected. The, the 2006 solution, of course, goes back to a previous government, um, and um, you have, uh, we'll have another government in a few years, and so this is not the end of the story by any means, but even President Park will have to continue to sell this deal, uh, this arrangement that is basically continuity for the next few years. Uh, it may look differently depending on North Korean behavior. So we haven't seen since 2009 and 10 um, either another nuclear test or uh, lethal uses of force on the part of North Korea in that time. 
Um, and so if we see a fourth nuclear test, if we see more lethal use of force on the one hand, then I don't think there's any problem selling that. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand we see a real change of heart and six-party talks resuming and North Korea actually undertaking uh, tangible steps that start to convince people that maybe they don't want to give away their nuclear weapons, but maybe they're willing to, to lower the temperature and get along uh, in a more civilized behavior. Uh, I think, yeah, it's possible that this could be a difficult issue for, um, uh, for President Park, but at the same time, she could be redefining this going forward as well, since it's condition-based in this mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. Very good. Since the 2012 test and then subsequent to that, the satellite uh, launch yes. uh, slash missile test, um, there has, has been growing concern. Uh, North Korea seems to be, uh, at least in recent months, in something of a diplomatic uh, charm offensive, to use one of the media descriptions. Uh, where do you think we sit in terms of the view of the threat of North Korea? And that's really our entree into sure. discussion about the elections and the political cycle as well. Well, that's terrific. Uh, of course, 2012 was the third test. That 2009 was the second test. I misspoke on that. Um, we have seen a charm offensive over the last couple of months uh, from uh, the North Korean government, and it's uh, manifested itself in sending high-level envoys to Europe, the foreign minister here to New York, um, uh, to reaching out to Prime Minister Abe to talk about a potential historic deal on the abductee issue. Um, and then North Korea went into hiding a bit. Uh, Kim Jong-un went into his 40 days of, in the wilderness. But you also had the North Korean government back off of the uh, report that they had promised the Japanese government. The Japanese government had virtually said, look, we're going to release some funding. We're going to relieve some of this financial pressure on you. Um, relieving sanctions if you would finally come clean on more information about the whereabouts of Japanese citizens who were abducted back in the 70s. This is old information. One could imagine that inside North Korea, although we don't have any view of what's actually happening in this kind of discussion, surely when people talked about the abduction report, they must have had mixed feelings <laughs> about handing out very, very sensitive secrets uh, about abduction, uh, which would have been a covert operation. Um, to Japan of all countries, uh, an arch enemy uh, for the North Korean regime, um, and yet they seem to be heading in that direction. It was a, it was it was going to happen, and and Abe was even ready to go to North Korea if if there could be information. That would have been really historic, and yet they backed off. And this is the same time that Kim Jong Un is in hiding, maybe having surgery, um, maybe there's a purge of some more officials going on inside North Korea. We don't really have good window of what's happening. From my perspective of what we can see is that North Korea uh, classically buys time uh, by these diplomatic overtures. So what we've seen in North Korean uh, diplomacy in these last couple of months, including the opportunity to possibly participate in this Northeast Asian Peace and Cooperation Initiative, the NAPC meeting, which is the new iteration of a South Korean uh, sub-regional Northeast Asian uh, uh, program, that could build more from the ground up, kind of less contentious issues of cooperation, like energy uh, and other issues, health, um, and try to bring countries in the region together rather than focusing on the really hard neurologic issue of nuclear uh, issues where you've got a six-party talk. North Korea is tinkering with possibly going there. North Korea sent the highest delegation ever to South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, North Korea has... Um, you know, hinted at uh, wanting to have another moratorium deal. And the U.S., in return, has shown some flexibility in this past week. So you've got Sid Seiler, who's no liberal on North Korea. He's a, he's a very hard-headed realist and knows North Korea very well, saying, look, the United States could resume six-party talks if North Korea uh, would agree to a moratorium on missile tests and nuclear tests. Well, that brings us right back to 2012, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that was a very harsh experience. So you've got the second term of the Obama administration um, looking uh, at dealing with Kim Jong-un, thinking there's an opportunity. Kim Jong-un seems to embrace a deal that had basically been worked out before with his now deceased father to freeze missile and nuclear tests. And it all falls apart, as you recall, when they didn't launch missiles per se, they launched rockets. <laughs> But the distinction between the missiles and rockets from a U.S. perspective was non-existent. It was basically mm -hmm. a stalking horse for a three-stage intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, from a North Korean perspective, who knows? 
Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, they wanted to make the case it was a space program, it was a satellite launch program, it was a rocket program. Um, and we haven't seen another nuclear test on that since then, but we, we do know that they continue to have prepared for potential further nuclear tests. Um, so they're buying time because they've given away nothing yet. Mm -hmm. um, they're starting to get some relief of pressure, which they need. They wanted to relieve pressure on the Human Rights Report that was just about to possibly get referred to the International Criminal Court. North Korea clearly did not want that step to be taken. I think North Korea probably has some further doubts in this year about China's support relative to previous years. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're not going to trust uh, Chinese support. They're not going to take that for granted. They can't. They've alienated China to, to, to some extent. Um, China's not going to give away North Korea, but at the same time, they, they can't just roll over and support some of the things that Kim Jong-un has done in particular. So it's, um, they're buying time uh, to relieve pressure, to gain access to some external resources, and thirdly, to, to try to deal with the internal machinations of North Korean politics. And that is a black hole for us. Mm -hmm. There is no expert I know who actually understands and has talked to the people in charge you know, about what's going on there. I don't know, but the point is we, we should all be asking questions about what what could be taking place back there. And I mentioned my supposition, for instance, on the abductee report, that mm -hmm. surely that had to lead to some tension. And if these purges are real, and we've already, you know, they're following on the purges of other relief of senior officials and the killing of the uncle, uh, Chang Sung Tech. I mean, there's enough going on that it's not all unanimity, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's, it's, that's not human nature to be unanimous anyhow. It may be politically the only thing one can do in public, but it has meant that North Korea can only, um, uh, North Korea elite really can determine the future of what's going on. Is power being more shared, even if Kim is the only legitimate mm -hmm. heir to the dynasty? Is it being, is it being more diffuse? Or uh, are the elites somehow not entirely satisfied with the way some things are going? Um, yeah. Do they want more or less? Yeah. Fu fundamental questions. Yeah. Do you see an opportunity in the release of, of Jeffrey Falk? Well, of course, every American has to welcome the release of Americans being held prisoner uh, in North Korea. But again, one sees this first and foremost as a very cynical ploy of kind of trading people for uh, uh, bargaining leverage. Uh, in this case, avoiding the referral of the Human Rights Report to the ICC, including getting Secretary Kerry and even President Obama to go a little light, lighter over North Korea in, in their discussions with uh, President Xi and with other officials, uh, including President Park, um, in the region, um, and to um, uh, consider even the six-party talks resumption, uh, mm. which, from a North Korean perspective right now, based on everything we've seen in the past, is still a, a delaying tactic, right? No seriousness on this. Even if a moratorium would be better than continued proliferation, and it would be, um, how do we know that that's really what they're going to do? And that's one of the problems we've had with engaging North Korea. There's zero trust, mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's, a, there's a very bad track record on both sides of distrust on this issue, but it is, uh, it, it's also fraught, and this is where you get into the politics, there's very little latitude and scope for the Obama administration to do much in concrete terms in terms of engaging North Korea without really tangible steps on the part of North Korea. So... For President Obama to bring back an agreement like the Leap Day deal, which says North Korea promises this time, really, honest to goodness, mm -hmm. not to launch a long-range rocket or missile and not to have a nu another nuclear test, while some would welcome that, um, I suspect that he will be uh, really raked over the coals by Congress. And that's where we can talk about the Senate changing leadership sure. and how that will be uh, at a, this literally... Uh, uh, a staging ground for beating up the White House uh, over that kind of issue right now. Sure. So let's talk about that in terms of the limitations that may develop within Washington and how that affects our sure. response. So, I mean, just stepping back politically, uh, I mean, and, and I've, I've looked in anticipation of this talk today in particular at a lot of the websites of candidates in both the House and the Senate and really awful things to read about. I mean, the, the campaigns and the, the things they say out there, it's really incredible for anybody who, who wants to focus on the more substantive side of policy and, and issues. Um, there's some uh, amazing uh, campaign tactics uh, out there. 
that I won't go into, but only to say that um, where we are right now, just days before the midterm election, um, and in the last two years of the Obama administration, basically after that, uh, you have uh, very little change actually in the House of Representatives uh, mm -hmm. now expected. So the Republicans are going to continue to control the House of Representatives. Republicans had originally hoped that they'd have historic control over that, maybe more than the uh, historic high back in the 80th Congress, when my great uncle was elected to Congress in 1946. Um, that Congress, they sat in 1947, um, after the war, they enacted 388 pieces of legislation, public law, in s the first six months. <laughs> Can you imagine if our Congress were that active? Um, I don't think we'd know what to do with it. <laughs> Um, so very different time, um, and I'm not attributing that to the, being the historic high of the Republicans. I think it was coming out of the war together and out of a common uh, sort of view that we're in this together, and that broke down, of course, over so many things. You know, post Vietnam, post Watergate, uh, post Cold War, um, and post 9/11 experience as well with Iraq and other issues. So we've had an ongoing set of uh, challenges. So the House is not really going to change, even if a few committee assignments change, like in the House Armed Services Committee, Thornberry will take over uh, since uh, Buck McKean is, uh, McKean is um, retiring. Um, and, you know, but those are modest changes. In the mm -hmm. Senate, that's the one everybody's been watching because, of course, the Republicans are largely expected to take a uh, majority of seats, 51 uh, it, at least, would be required to control and change the chair's of the Senate committees, and as as of today, the latest polls went back to only 51 seats mm -hmm. being likely, whereas the Republicans it looked like they might take 52, 53 just yesterday. You know, so it, this is still volatile. There's still enough close races, and I'm not the expert on this issue, although it's, it's, it is fascinating to watch. It's sort of like baseball statistics. I do expect some surprises. I do expect the pundits not to get every one of these seats right. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't want to start calling them out, but I have my own suspicions of some states that right now, some of the, my friends, Larry Sabato, I was at the University of Virginia with him. My wife and I were both on the faculty. I mean, he's got good picks and very logical. He's got a great methodology, but he may be wrong in a couple of these cases. So he's only got four toss-ups right now, uh, one of which seems to be going independent in Kansas, mm -hmm. which is interesting because it creates this question, can you have an independent caucus of three votes? Well, maybe, but if the Republicans have 51 seats, it doesn't really matter. Um, you could end up having, though, Mitch McConnell actually losing, um, which at, at this point, since it's so, it's, it's, it's beyond uh, the margin of error right now, uh, or, or less than the margin of error in terms of this, so he wouldn't necessarily be the Senate majority leader. So that would be an interesting twist as well mm -hmm. if the, the Republicans take over, but it's not McConnell's face you see kind of as, at this. But the Republican strategy, um, to the extent there is a strategy, I think is um, set uh, for the post midterm, assuming that they win. And even if they lose, um, they'll blame it on the Democrats running against the president. Mm -hmm. So they'll, both sides will spin whatever happens in this election. Wasn't as bad, wasn't as good, you know, they lost really. So we'll expect both sides to, to spin this. But in terms of policy, um, I do expect the chairman of, and chairwoman of the committees to change in the Senate. And that will change the ability for the Senate to control the dialogue out of Congress over the next two years. And not just the dialogue, but where we have compromises. So in some committees, I mean, Lisa Murkowski taking over energy could mean more likely a Keystone pipeline, but also probably some kind of energy deal, right? Because it could be, compromise could be made. This is not, there's room for compromise and uh, the White House uh, within constraints supports the general idea. Um, you know, on armed services, with John McCain, like would would take the helm if the Republicans have a majority, and uh, John McCain will no doubt have numerous uh, dialogues on ISIS and on Iraq and Syria, uh, but also um, he would be very involved in anything on North Korea. That if if suddenly the policy were to change one way or the other, uh, he'll certainly be talking about America's force posture in the Asia Pacific. Um, Bob Corker will certainly, if he takes over the uh, Foreign Relations Committee, uh, again, a more moderate voice, somebody who has privately talked about even supporting the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea if you could muster the vote. So not, not your typical kind of what you'd expect, a uh, fire-breathing um, sort of critic of, of some of the administration's policies by any means, but he can be very critical. But I think he would be looking for some big compromises on foreign affairs, and he might therefore support in general, we'd have to go through country by country, some of the rebalancing diplomacy and foreign affairs that might happen. 
Uh, certainly would be a big supporter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership as well, uh, which is going to be one of the big possible questions. Back on McCain, one of the big questions is uh, whether this next Congress will end sequestration and the kind of forced cuts on defense. Um, a lot of people are hankering. My CEO, in fact, was just quoted again today mm -hmm. uh, in a major bipartisan report as saying that uh, we do jeopardize our own readiness to deal with the full range of contingencies if we keep sequestration. Throughout my trip, Guam, where the United States last week were looking at uh, following through with uh, force structure improvements out there for training the region. I had Koreans out there and Japanese cooperating on regional training that could, could happen up in Guam, very interesting, um, but that requires uh, enough funding, and um, and that partly is the sequestration where we're hurting um, our readiness because we're we're raiding the one budget that people can raid, which is the operations and maintenance budget, mm -hmm. and so they take it out of daily operations because that money is more accessible; it's not as programmed, and they take it because they needed to pay for weapon systems or other things that they can't agree to cut. <laughs> mm -hmm. So because of that, and. The, the arms debate will be very different in the defense discussion, how much is enough and what do we need? Uh, littoral combat ship, for instance, which is kind of the presence, small light presence ship that the administration has supported. Um, and we've already got now our second littoral combat ship based in uh, at the present in uh, Singapore. Up to four will be there by 2017. A very good ship. It doesn't threaten anybody. It's just a small ship. Mm -hmm. But it, it allows you to engage smaller countries, not just Singapore, but Philippines and Vietnam and Indonesia, Malaysia, and other countries in Southeast Asia, not so small, but uh, states that we haven't been operating as much with in the past. Um, but uh, for defense uh, analysis reasons, Senator McCain is a big critic of the littoral combat ship. It's too expensive and not enough firepower, not enough teeth. So you see these things changing the debate in intelligence as well with Burr taking over in intelligence. He'll be in the hot seat on trying to uh, have endless debates about why did the administration miss ISIS? You know, why did the administration? No, no, no. You can see those debates going down not a very fruitful path. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does depend. These chairmanships uh, will matter. Appropriations, you know, the budget committee. Budget committee is very important because all the writers that will go on the bills, this is where the real Congress will do its real dirty tricks. <laughs> you know, it basically put writers on bills. So the bill itself may be unobjectionable, but then you put a writer saying, and you can only spend this money under the following conditions, mm -hmm. you know, that you meet my expectations of what I need. And that's where the question is, will the Obama White House, especially if they lose control over the Senate, as they look for consolidating their legacy, as well as managing the crises that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, can they compromise and reach a deal? Mm -hmm. And with some, you know, energy I mentioned, possibly Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Trade Promotion Authority, yeah, possibly, but it's going to take compromises. The Republican leadership is going to say, look, we won, we didn't negotiate this deal, and if you have, Mr. President, finally come back from all these summits in November and finally given us a deal to look at, we'll look at it, but we need some changes. Sure. And will the White House say, yeah, sure, we'll make those changes and I'll sell them back to Prime Minister Abe and to Prime Minister Abbott and others? Maybe. Or maybe they'll say, look, I had the deal, you messed it up, uh, my successor will pick it up. Sure, sure. Patrick, let me ask you one last question flowing from that and before we turn the uh, Q&A over to our very talented audience here. And that is, um, as you look then at the last two years of the Obama administration, which has uh, had this policy of strategic uh, patience um, uh, and questions about both the influence from the Hill and the responsivity, as you indicate, as well as questions of historical legacy. Uh, certainly Korea, as a, as in terms of the Republic of Korea, has enjoyed a unique relationship uh, overall in the Obama administration. And then as you see uh, candidates emerging um, and thinking about Asia, uh, we had Jeb Bush in town talking at the Council of Foreign Relations to a predominantly Korean-American audience about some of his thoughts on, on Korea going forward. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton has had a great deal uh, to say over time on Korea. Um, and, uh, you know, as Chris Christie and others maybe potentially emerge, where, where do you see uh, Asia and foreign policy uh, in the process? Will foreign policy be more of an issue in 2016, uh, following on the W and Obama years? And, yeah, uh, a range of critics of both. 
I, I think it will, and, um, and that's based on mostly the kind of reaction I'm getting from a lot of different communities um, in the last few months, that um, foreign affairs, uh, international affairs, international trade, international defense and security, Asia Pacific, as well as the Middle East, will, and Russia and Europe for that matter, and Ukraine, all of these issues are, are very big on the, on the table. But from Ebola to nuclear weapons, um, people are scared, and that fear is being infused in the political process, unfortunately, not always to positive effect. Um, but uh, there are enough crises going on around the world that people really do feel like the United States is, is, is not getting international support to kind of put these in some kind of framework that we can deal effectively with them. And you know, like strategic patience, the question is, is the United States leading enough? Is the United States able to lead? Are we, you know, before we were too active in the Middle East, now we're maybe too inactive as we follow up on implementation of key strategies like rebalancing to the Asia Pacific or um, buying time ourselves to deal with North Korea. Um, and the problem with buying time and the problem with gridlock and even potential shutdown for our government over the next two years and having a lame duck uh, you know, present the last two years of any presidency, you still have um, a lot of dynamism in Asia. Asia is not going to sit still. <laughs> you know, whether it's the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that the Chinese are creating, uh, whether it's uh, overtures from North Korea, changes from our allies, including in South Korea and Japan, uh, Australia, uh, whether it's the new Indonesian and Indian governments that want to drive economies, uh, their economies moving forward. There's a lot of dynamism going on in Asia right now. Things are not standing still. We may stand still, <laughs> or virtually. In which case, then the question is, who fills that vacuum? What are the opportunity costs? What does our next president inherit, the next administration inherit? Where do they start the ground running uh, on this? So on Korea, North Korea, um, you know, the first you've got to make sure you, you deter conflict from breaking out. So you've got to just make sure you don't mess it up. And I think the, you know, the U.S. has done a good job of that, I think. They get high marks, and I think um, this latest, uh, the 2 plus 2 meeting today with the foreign and defense ministers, uh, is, it shows that both sides are serious about making sure that deterrence holds. Um, in terms of dealing with North Korea, no. The strategic patience has not really panned out very well for anybody. Um, U.S., was probably too slow to try to reach out uh, after Kim Jong-un came to power. But then when it finally did with the Leap Day deal, nobody was home. That is, there was no follow-through from North Korea, just the opposite, the third nuclear test, the missile rocket test, um, and the refusal to really engage the new South Korean government in any positive, constructive way uh, was more of a hallmark of North Korean policy. Now there's a peace overture. So we have to see whether there's something there. Again, we always have an obligation. We have to never stop talking. But uh, we shouldn't necessarily expect this time will be different based on all of our historical experience on this, even if we hope that it will be. So if that doesn't change between now and 2016, um, this issue will be um, a debate because North Korea will have achieved even uh, probably a nuclear-tipped uh, intercontinental ballistic missile capability, including with mobile missiles, including with significant cyber capabilities. In, um, and um, if that's the case, then it will be an election issue. Uh, not that one side can blame the other, uh, but nonetheless a concern about what to do about it will be, will be an issue. Right now, Asia and rebalancing policy is getting crowded out by all of the problems elsewhere that we've seen develop this past year. And the concern in Asia is still, what's America's staying power and follow through? Can we have a coherent strategy? So we need a more coherent strategy. We need a new consensus. We have to elevate the dialogue in Washington, both in Congress and the executive branch and with the next president in that administration on what is our Asia Pacific policy for the long term. Forget the word rebalancing. It's a, it's a strong, engaged U.S. presence cooperation building, order building, security maintenance uh, set of postures that we need in this region. We, we need a basic consensus, and that could break down over the debates you may hear in the Senate over the next year or two, um, where people disagree over how much military, you know, is, is trade promotion authority going to happen or not? Mm -hmm. um, what about the uh, expectation of allies doing more? Um, are we doing enough? Uh, what are we doing with respect to China and the China uh, U.S. meeting will figure prominently in Beijing when President Obama basically casts the 
meeting with Xi Jinping as a second Sunnyland summit. That was his big informal, less formal summit meeting in California uh, early last year. Uh, they will talk about cooperation on things like Ebola and uh, even ISIS. But underlying surface, even despite some confidence building measures that they'll talk about on maritime territorial disputes, there'll still be just as much competition and concern about where this is going. Not quite, not quite a, a more solid uh, relationship, still uncertain, even on North Korea, where we've asked China to do a lot more. And China's this week just, again, essentially indicated we're not going to refer that uh, human rights report to the International Criminal Court. That wouldn't be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where China continues to be on North Korea, which is yeah. a little bit helpful, but not that helpful. Yeah. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for your call for, for a new consensus, and, and let's hope that that's increasingly uh, bipartisan. You've taken us full circle, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Patrick Cronin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.